Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have with me Dr. Nitin Bhatia. Dr. Bhatia is a spine surgeon who is the chief of spine surgery at University of California, Irvine. Dr. Bhatia did his undergraduate training at Stanford. He then went on to Baylor College of Medicine where he completed his MD degree. From there, he did orthopedic surgery training at UCLA. From there, he finished a, a spine fellowship at the University of Miami. Today, he practices complex spine surgery at University of California, Irvine. Good day, Dr. Bhatia. Thank you for having me. Dr. Bhatia, what I'd like to turn to now to discuss is a, is a, is a concept that I don't think a lot of people are familiar with, but it's, spine surgeons are familiar with it, obviously. It's, it's called spondylolisthesis. Define what that long word means. <laughs> spondylolisthesis is, is our fancy medical term for when the bones in the spine slip a little on each other. We classically see it in the low back or lumbar spine. Most commonly, not at the very bottom level, but one level up, lumbar four, lumbar five, although it can occur anywhere through there, and it can even occur somewhat in the neck. What happens is, with time, the joints wear out, much like the hinges on a door may wear out. And instead of holding the bones immediately on top of each other, the bones start to slip. With the top bone, in this case lumbar four, sliding in front of lumbar five. Now, why four on five? Why is that the one that, that occurs most commonly? That's a great question. Probably that's the level that sees the most wear and tear and has the most motion and forces upon it in the lumbar spine. So its joints, both the disc in the front, which is the big shock absorber um, in the front of the spine, as well as the two smaller joints in the back of the spine, called the facet joints, wear out faster than the areas where they don't see as much motion and wear and tear. Now, there's another term that's commonly confused with spondylolisthesis, and that's spondylolysis. We, we think of these two terms together, but define for me the difference between those two things. Sure. Spondylolysis is spondy, which is essentially spine, and then lysis, which means break or fracture. So a spondylolysis is actually a small fracture in the back of the spine, that we see more commonly in, in our teenage patients, especially high-level athletes who do a lot of hyperextension. So gymnasts, football linemen who have to come up and block a lot. Nowadays, especially in my practice in Southern California, I see surfers and snowboarders because they do a lot of extension. Mm -hmm. At a point in their teenage years, the bones were slightly weaker than they are in the rest of our lifetimes, and they can have a small fracture there. That can also lead to a spondylolisthesis, which is a slippage of the bones. Although usually, if it's associated with the fracture, it's one level below the degenerative type, which I was talking about before. So the, the spondylolysis, which is an isthmic spondylolisthesis, mm -hmm. is at lumbar five, sacrum one. Yeah, and I just wanted to make that clear because I think it's easily confused. I think a lot of physicians confuse the two. and, and and seem to think that they're one and the same. And the difference, as I understand, is that one is because of a wear and tear phenomenon. And the slippage still occurs. You still see it on the x-ray, but for totally different reasons. That's exactly In different areas. Exactly right. And today, what we're really going to talk about, I think, is the adult, the one with the wear and tear right. spondylolisthesis, how that differs from the other one. And, and it's different not only in its causes, but how you treat it. Exactly. So... Tell me what symptoms a person has who has a degenerative spondylolisthesis. How old are they? How do they present? A degenerative spondylolisthesis occurs as we age from the wear and tear and degeneration of the joints. So it's a problem that we see usually in patients over the age of 50 or 60. Sometimes it can occur in patients in their 40s, but rarely are they younger than that. What we see is that the patients gradually develop some back pain but more importantly, they may have some compression on their nerves, causing pain shooting down the legs, like a sciatica-type pain. Why is that? I mean, where does the pressure come from? The pressure comes from not only now the abnormal motion of the bones, so as the bones move forward, the nerves which lie behind the bones get kind of pinched in that abnormal alignment. Mm. But as the body tries to stop this abnormal motion, it creates extra tissue, both uh, bony osteophytes or bone spurs, 
as well as extra ligament, a particular ligament called a ligamentum flavum, which then pushes on the sensitive nerves in that region, and that's where the pressure on the nerves comes from. So those nerves that are leaving the spine at that exactly. point just get trapped. Exactly. They, they can't, don't have enough room to get out. And, and what is that, how does that present? I mean, what does the patient feel from that standpoint? Usually the patient feels a combination of pain, numbness, or tingling shooting down the legs, most commonly in the side of the legs and side of the thighs and calves, or the back of the legs in the buttock, back of the thighs, back of the calves, and into the feet. And when you see this patient, when, let's say this person is, when you see this, pers this person, and let's say uh, they, they've had some x-rays, their primary care physician has seen this slippage, became alarmed, sent them to you. How are you going to begin the process of trying to figure out, first, what's going on with their back? Because we're not certain that that slippage is causing the pain. How are you going to work that person up? What do you need to do? Well, the number one thing we have to do is figure out, is the slippage causing their pain? And that involves uh, getting to know the patient and their problem and seeing where their pain really is. Making sure it fits the picture of the spondylolisthesis or the slipped vertebra. Um, we can do a physical exam to check for any strength problems, numbness, um, or uh, nerve irritability. And then we can also check x-rays to see if the bones are moving. And one particular x-ray that's useful in this case is flexion extension x-rays, or x-rays taken with the patient bending forward and then bending backward to see how much those bones are really moving. Sometimes you see that they move very little. Sometimes you see them almost dislocate they move so much. Um, and then finally, we can get a test called an MRI scan, which shows us the nerves and can show us how much pinching there is of those nerves at that area, as well as other areas above and below it. Now, you, you mentioned the flexion extensions, and you mentioned some folks move a lot. I'm assuming more is worse. That's correct. More is definitely worse. So if they're not moving a lot when they're moving forward and backwards, we're less, we're, we're less concerned about that spondylolisthesis and think that may not be causing the pain? Well, it still could be causing the pain, and I'm concerned about any spondylolisthesis with pain coming from it but I'm much more concerned about people who have a lot of motion because that tells me that their joints are so worn out that every time they move like that, they're just beating up those poor nerves. Mm -hmm. Now, even with a little spondylolisthesis, you have that, those extra bone spurs and that extra ligament causing the nerve compression and causing the, the patient's symptoms. So we're concerned, but it's probably not going to get worse as rapidly as the person who's moving a lot. Well, you know, define for me this, this problem with spondylolisthesis. Is this primarily a leg pain problem or primarily a back pain problem, or is it balanced? Are we seeing both? You can see them both. And um, you see people who have the back pain from the mechanical problem of the bones moving and the associated degenerative arthritic changes of the joints. Okay. You can also see the significant leg pain from the nerve pinching, from the motion and the bone spurs and the other things that form from it. Okay, so, and, and you mentioned that essentially what you want to see as a spine surgeon is I want to see the MRI scan. I want to see what's happening to the soft tissues. Mm -hmm. I want to see what's happening to those nerves. And I want to see a dynamic test, the okay. flexion extension x-rays, to see how much it's moving. Any other tests you want to see? Usually those are, are ample for what we need to see. Okay. So after you've made this diagnosis, what's next? How are you going to treat me? One of the questions is, how severe are your symptoms? And hopefully the symptoms aren't so bad, in which case we can try a course of physical therapy, specifically focused on what we call core strengthening, to make the muscles in the abdomen and low back stronger to theoretically stabilize this slipping area somewhat. Now, it can't fully stabilize it, but perhaps by providing a little more support, it can decrease some of the pain. Some of the other treatments include oral medicines like anti-inflammatories or low-dose narcotics, as well as possibly injections into the arthritic facet joints or even epidural steroid injections to calm the nerves down a little. And is that, I mean, are you expecting those injections to to fix the problem, or, or is this just treatment? Unfortunately, they don't fix the problem. We know that the problem is truly a structural problem in the spine. Those joints have essentially fallen apart, and in fact, we sometimes on the MRI scans, we see the joints have so much wear and tear in them, they even have fractures through them. 
um, and the joints, instead of being nice sandwiched together, they've splayed apart, so there's really no more control of that level. So the injections can't fix that. All they can really do is give the patient some symptomatic relief. When do you make the decision that, that this is not going to work, that, that conservative care has failed, and it's time to consider surgical options? When the patients, when we've, we've tried appropriate options and they just haven't gotten better, or in patients who the pain is so significant that it's not worth it to spend three months or six months trying non-surgical options, um, probably because we know the non-surgical options for this provide only temporary relief. And really, most patients who have symptoms from this, at some point or the other, will require surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it's interesting because this is an instability problem. Do you think there's any place for bracing in these patients? I mean, do these patients respond to braces? Is there any, any need to try a back brace or anything like that? There's not. And the reason is there's, this problem can't heal even if we put it in a brace. If you broke your arm and I put you in a cast or a brace, the bones would heal and it would go back to normal so we could maybe avoid surgery. But this isn't that kind of problem. So even if I put you in a brace or a whole body cast or put you on bed rest for three months, it would not heal and it would not stop this abnormal motion. So there's no role in bracing. And in fact, bracing can be somewhat um, problematic because it can make the muscles weaker by making the body rely on the brace rather than its own internal muscles, which are its internal brace, and then allow more of the abnormal motion when you're not in the brace. Mm -hmm. Now, is, are we still talking about an elective procedure from the standpoint, is this still the choice of the patient whether to pursue surgery or not, or is there any reason you would say, you know, you really, it's in your best interest to have surgery and that's what you need? You know, in general, it's an elective procedure. Um, and what I tell patients who come in, I say we do surgery when you're sick of the pain and when you don't want to have it anymore. But it's not a problem that's going to paralyze the patient. It's not a problem where all of a sudden one day they're going to wake up and not be able to move their leg. Sometimes patients come in and it's really bad and they're, and they're having trouble walking because they have severe weakness. And that's a different story. But that's luckily for this problem quite rare. Most patients come in and they're, they're uncomfortable and they have significant pain. But when they decide they want to get rid of the pain is when we do surgery. So if they're willing to put up with the pain, mm -hmm. willing to put up or decrease their activity, then it's okay for them to opt to let this go as long as possible. Correct. And if they want to be more active or they want to lead a more active life, then surgery is a good option for them. Ex exactly. What are our surgical options? How do you treat this surgically? The, the options really, really encompass the two main goals of spine surgery. And, the, and those two goals, goals are decompression or opening up the space for the nerves to stop the sciatica and leg pain. And number two, stabilization or stopping the abnormal motion. Mm -hmm. So the first part involves opening up the space for the nerves. And the classic procedure for that in the low back is called a laminectomy. And there's a variety of, of different options based around that that we can use that are tailored to each patient's particular needs. In order to stop the abnormal motion, we actually have to do what's called a fusion, where you put screws and rods in to lock the bones in place. Now, fusions sometimes get a bad, uh, a bad name out there because of horror stories that I'm sure everybody's heard. I've heard a lot of them. I'm sure you have, too. But for this problem, it's very clear that patients who have a fusion, especially a fusion with screws and rods, have a better long-term outcome than, they don't, than patients who don't because otherwise the motion keeps going and likely keeps getting worse and worse. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, the fusion has a bad name because I think it's being used inappropriately. Mm -hmm. Or it's used for reasons that aren't going to necessarily respond to the fusion. Exactly. I mean, we don't really know where it's coming from. I agree wholeheartedly. But this problem is, is a true problem, a true orthopedic problem, if you would. It's a problem with too much motion where there's instability. Right. Uh, something we probably understand fairly well. Um, just define for me again, though, uh, we banner about this term fusion and we talk about putting screws in, but what are we really trying to accomplish? I mean, what is a fusion? A fusion is just having the bones that are moving abnormally heal together. Um, in the past, we didn't use screws or rods before we had that technology, and we would take bone from another part of the body. Previously, we used to use uh, bone from the iliac crest, which is part of the pelvis or hip, uh, and put it around the bones which we're trying to heal together, and it creates 
kind of a bony bridge between the two. Nowadays, the technology is very different. We do have the screws which increase the rate and success of the fusions, as well as we have other technologies like bone morphogenic proteins, which are uh, man-made proteins made in the lab that replicate human body proteins that can make bone instead of having to take bone from the pelvis, so it allows faster recovery. Yeah, I think, I think your, your, your analogies are very, are very useful. You know, we're orthopedists, so we, we're used to putting cast on things, holding things in place. And then we had plates and screws. Right. So we take away the cast, put a plate and a screw on the inside of the skin so you don't have to wear the brace on the outside. For years, we put people in body casts to try to brace a fusion to get it to heal more, more reliably. Now with those screws and the rods, we can brace it internally so that the patient doesn't have to wear a body cast and get a better healing rate. Exactly. And in fact, in, in my practice, when we put the screws and rods in for a procedure like this, the patient doesn't get any sort of rigid brace at all because the screws and rods are so strong on the inside, it provides better bracing and better uh, healing than any sort of body cast you can be in. Yeah. I think the other term you used, and I think you explained it very succinctly, and that is the concept of decompression. But elaborate on that a little bit. I mean, to my, to my sort of thinking, what we're really trying to do is give those nerves as much breathing room, take pressure off. Whatever's pressing on them, we just take it away. And we, we call it a laminectomy, but that's just a term. What right. we're really doing is trying to chip away those bone spurs, take away all the pressure on the nerves. I exactly. You know, normally we live our whole lives with the nerves nicely protected by the fluid that's around them and the fat that's around them. And that's a nice, soft bed for nerves to lie in. And that's what nerves like to be in. So when all of a sudden you get bone spurs pushing on it or a really tough ligament pushing on it, the, the nerves don't like it. And that's when you get the shooting pain down the legs. So the goal of the decompression is just to take that pressure off. And wherever those, those bone spurs are, we go in and just shave them away and open up the space for those nerves once again and make it more normal. Well, let's go back to this from the patient's perspective. What does this whole procedure look like? I mean, how long are we in the hospital? How long does it take to recover? And what are my expectations before I'm completely well? There's two ways we can do it. One way is a kind of a, a classic, what I call mini open way, through a small couple inch incision in the middle of the back. Um, sometimes if patients have really, really tight nerve compression, um, or for a variety of other reasons, that's a preferable way to do the surgery. Um, usually they're in the hospital for, the surgery itself takes a couple hours with a very low blood loss. Um, they're in the hospital in the hospital for usually three days, give or take a day. Some patients may go home uh, two days after surgery, some patients stay an extra day. Um, up and walking the same day as surgery or maybe the next morning. Usually within six weeks back doing almost all activities that they want to be doing and within three months definitely doing all activities that they want to be doing. The other option is a minimally invasive surgery where we make two smaller incisions to the outside area of the spine and that can be really beneficial for patients who've got problems mainly on one side, either the left or the right. Um, we do the exact same kind of procedure uh, through these small incisions. The small incisions may allow a little faster recovery in the short term, but probably long term wise the results are the same as the as the mini open procedure. And you're doing the same, it's just smaller incisions. Exactly. You're still trying to relieve the pressure from the nerves and fuse that segment. Exactly. Um, what's the implications long term? If I've got a spondylolisthesis at, at L4-5, for example, you fix it, am I good to go from now on? Um, do I see some problems with the, the fusion? What should I expect long term from this? Fortunately, nowadays with our, our technologies, the, the rate of healing of fusions are very, very high. And so it's, it's, it's fairly rare to see a fusion not heal well. Um, once you've healed, and especially once you've gone out of the first three to six months after surgery, you're pretty much good to go. You can do almost any activity that you want to do, um, or essentially any activity that you want to do. The one thing that we do keep in mind is that people who have spine problems, such as the spondylolisthesis, probably have some genetic predisposition to spine problems. And so we have to keep an eye open for other problems at other levels in the future. So that degeneration is occurring at multiple levels, not just the one four on five. It's it, just the first one you see it at. Exactly. Um, complications. I mean, what do you worry about as a spine surgeon when you do this type of a fusion? What can happen that you're not expecting? The, the complications that we worry about are is that even if 
the surgery goes technically perfectly, um, sometimes the fusion doesn't heal because the fusion is not the process of putting the screws and rods in. The fusion is the process of having the bone heal and bridge those two bones uh, so that they stop moving. And that depends not only on the technology I use in the surgical pr uh, process, but of the patient's own body healing potential. Some patients are a little higher risk of that. Patients who smoke, patients who are diabetic, uh, patients who are significantly, significantly overweight. Um, but that's why we use all of the new technology that we have, including the screws, including the bone forming proteins, everything we need to do to give the patient the highest rate of success possible. Now, it, it, some of those things are under my control. If I'm a diabetic, I, I, the best I can probably do is control my blood sugars better. Exactly. If I'm overweight, I can lose weight. Does that increase the success of this procedure? Losing weight before surgery not only increases the rate of success, but also improves the post-operative outcomes and uh, recovery. And, and what about smoking? Same thing? Same. If, I, if I stop the day before surgery, am I still better off? We want you to stop usually four weeks to six weeks before so it all gets out of your system. Mm -hmm. But if you can stop, say, six weeks before and keep it off until you're healed for maybe one year after surgery, probably your results are the exact same. Even if you say, okay, one year and a day I'm going to go back to smoking. It won't affect your spine, it'll affect everything else, but just not that spine. Any other comments or anything that you would like patients to know that, that are afflicted with spondylolisthesis? Anything we haven't covered in our discussion um, that you would like your patients to know? You know, this is a very common problem, the spondylolisthesis or slipped vertebra. We're seeing it more and more because it is a problem of our older patients. Um, it occurs more commonly when you're over the age of 50 or 60 and occurs more commonly in women. It's so common now that the government even funded a multi-million dollar study looking at treatments for patients with spondylolisthesis and sciatica pain from it. And what they found was that the physical therapy and medicines and injections or the conservative treatments probably provided some temporary relief, but nothing permanent. And the patients who had surgery for it did statistically significantly better than the patients who didn't. And they were much happier years down the road. Now, not everybody needs surgery for it, but for people who's, whose lives are being affected by it, surgery provides a great option for this with a very rapid recovery. I essentially expect complete pain relief in the legs as soon as patients wake up from surgery with a minimal risk and great outcome. And I think the take-home message there is that not all back pain is the same. Right. That there are specific areas, and, and to sort of paint all back pain with the same brush, and if you've if you have this fear of, of surgery, or even if you, your, your notion is, is that spine fusion is a bad operation, should never be done, maybe that's not the case with this procedure or with this condition and, it, and spine fusion applied to this condition. But you might want to rethink it a little bit. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for watching today. If you have questions about the topic that we discussed today or any orthopedic topic, be sure to visit eorthopod.com. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon or healthcare provider interested in participating as a guest on eorthopod TV, you'll also find instructions on how to apply to become a guest on eorthopod TV. Thanks for watching.